the iPhone 6, the phone that changed everything for Apple, and the phone that I absolutely slated in the past on this very YouTube channel has come back into the house as my mum's new phone. And after all of these years, is it as bad as I really made it out to be, and as how I thought it was, or is it just a figment of my imagination? On eBay you can find one of these for around £100, but the question is should you buy one at £100? Hey guys, my name is Ryan Thomas from Failtech, and this is the iPhone 6, should you still buy one? The late 2014 released smartphone made a change that would change the course of Apple design forever. Gone were the harsh edges and smaller screen, in were curvy edges and, well, actually a bigger screen. Now, Apple's structural rigidity on the phones at this era were severely questioned when this one came around, especially with the Plus model. I always liked the feeling of the 6 and the 6S in the hand, the ultra smooth aluminium housing and melting glass that subtly moulds to the chassis are traits I really miss about smartphones today. The external buttons are characteristically super clicky and tactile along with the silent toggle even a few years down the line, and the bottom of the iPhone 6 reveals that glorious headphone port along with the lightning connector. Now there's one glaring omission from me here and that's the weather ceiling. Sure, the iPhone 6 should survive a light shower and if you're in the UK, well you know exactly what I mean, but I find the IP rating to be a requirement even more so than a headphone port for me personally. And if we flip the phone over to the front, we see some thick boy bezels. I personally like them and I won't rag on them too hard, but in 2018, even a Pixel 2 XL is laughed at humorously for its large surrounds. So the iPhone 6 just looks a bit like a relic. At the bottom of the front, there is a fingerprint reader, Touch ID Generation 1. That means you're not getting a fast scanner by any means and accuracy takes a drastic turn in anything other than good conditions. But I, for some reason, adore the physical button that it rests on. Sure, Taptic is cool in the newer iPhones, but the physical button is just another experience. Briefly talking about aesthetics, the only colour I liked in this lineup was this one, the space grey model, and I actually preferred the rose gold, but that was only available in the 6S, not the 6. And so along with the space grey, I actually really like the fact that it's markedly thin, with that tiny little camera bump up in the corner, available in all colours, but these days we just get such large camera bumps, and this one was just a little ditty one in the corner. And the fact that this phone was so small and was so thin made it incredibly ergonomic, and when putting a case on the phone, it didn't chunk it up too much. And what contributes to this is the tiny by today's standards 4.7 inch Retina IPS touch display. Seriously, 90 degrees squared off corners on a 16 by 9 panel are just refreshing to see. And Apple has always been good with their LG displays. The 6 offers more than enough pixels for your money, and sure, you can go and get a 1080p or even 1440p panel at this price on the Android side, but it's not necessary in the slightest. The IPS screen plonked on here is a really good one. It has accurate colours, great viewing angles, and a quality to it that OLED just can offer despite the contrast praise iOS 12 just seems to pop on this thing with its great colours, its very vibrant looking design, and of course that new notification and control centre option. Of course we lose out on 3D Touch, a feature that would be introduced in the next year, the iterative upgrade to the iPhone 6, the iPhone 6S. And sure, the display itself isn't a spec king, but at 326 pixels per inch, it's perfectly sharp enough for anyone, and anyone who really pixel peeps that much isn't going to spend £100 on a phone anyway. So in the display department, I have to call the iPhone 6 a winner just because there isn't a glaring issue with it. And because of that lower resolution screen, battery life isn't as bad as the 1810 milliamp hour battery would suggest. Sure, it's not going to perform to the standard of newer iPhones, and the Plus model is the one to get for enhanced battery longevity, but for someone like my mum who just wanted an iPhone and for emails, photos, calling, texting, and the odd banking, the 6 delivers a full day of usage with charging only at night time. For the average consumer, I'd say you should carry a charger or a battery bank with you, however, just due to the weakness of used batteries. Apple replaces the battery for around £30, and, and that's well recommended by me if you already have one of these. More on that later. But the 6 doesn't come with any cool charging tricks, it's not going to last you two days, and it's not got that glass back for wireless charging either. 
Performance under iOS 12 is actually a lot better than I was initially expecting. The outdated spec sheet reveals a dual core Apple A8 SoC, 1GB of RAM and a selection of storage options ranging from 16 to 128GB. Let me be clear, the speed is definitely not the strong point of the iPhone 6, but I was expecting basically a train wreck, loads of crashing, force restarting, almost boot looping. But what I got was, yeah, okay, there were a few stutters here and there, but the overall performance was actually better under iOS 12, much better in fact, than iOS 11. Although if you can get one with like iOS 9 or iOS 10, you're gonna get way better experiences. In heavy applications such as games, uh, 3D races and shooters in those games, and day-to-day -day tasks combined with browsing through the OS, the speed was miles better than I was expecting. There was the odd stutter here, like I said, and, and there were times where the animations would just be a little bit too much for the poor thing. But other than that, it was totally usable by a lot of people's standards. Now, this is under iOS 12.1 with the latest updates and I expect the iPhone 6 will continue to get software updates up to 13, but after that I doubt there will be any more. I like iOS 12 to be honest and Apple have made some much needed changes to the OS not only from the user perspective but also for the back end perspective. Cameras on paper look pretty dated, we've got an 8 megapixel f2.2 setup around the back with 1080p video recording capabilities and no optical image stabilization unless you pick up the bigger model and on the front a 1.2 megapixel f2.2 setup capable of shooting 720p video at 30 frames per second. So the specs don't stand out in 2018. In fact, the rear camera on the iPhone 6 is somewhere in the realm of most front-facing cameras on 2018 flagships. In reality, images and videos are decent in good light, but because the smaller phone lacks OIS on top of a fairly closed aperture, low light really suffers and you'll see blur in the dark and murky days of UK weather. The vibrance and colours look pretty good, actually, and I can see where Apple's colour science holds up here. Sharpness from the 8 megapixel shooter is kind of lacking. You won't notice it in the thumbnails, but in full screen photos, it does start to show its face. Video can look shaky too, due to that lack of OIS, which is something I don't care about as I don't shoot video on my phone, but some will. And due to that 8 megapixel camera, videos are limited to 1080p, with the slow motion option being 720p at 240 frames per second, where we are seeing 1000 frames per second at that resolution this year in other Android phones. And whilst the rear camera can slightly be forgiven, the 1.2 megapixel selfie camera may be not as much. It's so soft and so bad in low light where most selfies are taken that it just looks like it was taken on a Galaxy S2. Ironic really because the Galaxy S2 had a higher resolution front facing camera. In really good light, the selfies can look okay, but if you're really into Instagram and Snapchat, maybe skip this one for something else. Those of you who have known me for a while or been on this channel for a while will know that I was never gonna end this video without talking about the immense amount of problems the iPhone 6 has and how I think you should probably steer clear. The first one being something that I experienced personally, which is the Touch IC deficiency, which basically means that your touch digitizer will start acting up and doing random things. This isn't your fault, this is actually a manufacturing deficiency and it can lead to further problems down the road. Second is of course the bending, mainly with the Plus model, basically because its structural rigidity wasn't up to par. And these phones have been known for their incredibly bad battery problems. Now this is again something that you can go around and change because you can actually go to the Apple shop and they'll change your battery for like £30 or something like that, which isn't too bad, but because there are so many problems associated with the iPhone 6 and how the iPhone 6 sits relatively close to the iPhone 6s, I recommend going with that slightly better model. And yes, I know the iPhone 6 in a lot of countries is way, way cheaper, but if you can, really do stretch that success because you're getting way better performance, incredibly better cameras, and of course, you were lacking all of those problems that the iPhone 6 had. So going back to the question, should you still buy one? I don't think so. Sorry guys, if you're an iPhone 6 fan, then maybe you should stay clear of my videos. And that's about it from me guys. Please do like, dislike, comment, and subscribe if you're new around here to never miss a video like this one. Also check out my social media, links to that and the Discord will all be in the video description as always. I wanna thank you all so much for watching. I wanna thank my patrons for their amazing continued support. You guys are fantastic. My name's been Ryan Thomas from Feltech and I'll see you in the next video. Peace.